we on? Well, good morning and welcome to worship with us here at Grace Point Church. We're so glad everybody's here today. We're looking forward to a great time of worship, not only this morning, but all month long as we celebrate Jesus, the reason for the season. So we're going to be having a birthday party for Jesus all month long. And uh, just thank you for being with us. Those of you that are joining us online, God bless you for being with us today. You, you can even just shoot an email or text message somebody. Tell them to join you for worship here at Grace Point Church uh, on our YouTube channel. And um, how many of you thought when you woke up this morning, what a beautiful day in South Florida. Isn't this the reason we all live in South Florida? This is why we put up with all those hurricane warnings, right? This is the price of living in paradise, but we're glad you're here today, and we hope that uh, you will experience God's goodness and God's blessing here this morning. Let's bow our hearts together and just pray and go to the Lord uh, as we begin to worship. Father, we do just love you and thank you for your goodness. We thank you for this season, this time of year that reminds us that you came into this world and that, Lord, you will come into our lives and bring new life and bring joy and hope and love and blessing. And so, Lord, we pray that you would just come and fill this place, fill our hearts with your spirit, fill this room, this atmosphere with the sense of your power and presence and purpose for us. Lord, we lift up folks that are here today that may be hurting, may be struggling, going through a tough time. We pray for folks that are joining us online, literally all over the world. And we just pray that you would meet us right here today at the very point of our need. We thank you that you said all is vain unless the spirit of the Holy One comes down. So Lord, we gather today in your presence and we just thank you that we can be with you, and that because of Jesus, because of our Emmanuel, Lord, we celebrate that God can be with us. And so we just pray that you would bless us today in this whole Christmas season as we focus on your love and your grace and your purpose in our lives. It's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. Voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. Oh, oh, oh. Am I more than just the sum of every high and every God, remind me once again just who I am because I need to know. Ooh, oh. You say I'm strong when I can't feel a thing. You say I am loved when I think I am weak. You say I am held when I short and when I don't belong oh you say I am yours and I believe oh I believe what you say of me I believe the only thing that matters now is everything you think I find my worth in you, I find my identity. Ooh, oh, oh. You say I am strong when I think I am weak. You say I am love when I And we 
taking all I have and now I'm laying it at your feet, oh God. Oh, you have every failure, God. You have every victory. Oh, oh. Amen. God bless you. God bless you, Gerald. Thank you so much. The only thing that matters now is what you say of me. Christmas is going to change forever the way you see yourself. That's what Christmas does. It changes the way we see ourselves. Take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to begin a series this morning that we're going to take through the month of December, and we're going to talk about the naughty list. Now, how many of you remember being terrified that you were going to wind up on Santa's naughty list? I see big Mike back there with his hand up. Mike, do you still feel like you're on the naughty list sometimes? We all do, right? The naughty list that Santa Claus is coming to town and he's making a list and he's checking it twice. He's going to find out who's naughty and who's nice. Did you know that Jesus Christ is coming to town? He too has a list. And uh, I don't think Jesus needs to check it twice. And his sovereignty and his greatness, his glory... The Bible says it is a book of life. Other scriptures say it is the Lamb's book of life. And can I suggest to you that every name that's listed in the Lamb's book of life is a person who would belong on the naughty list. The Bible says all have sinned. Look at the person next to you and just point to him and say, he's talking about you there. All have sinned. Look back at that person and say, I think that includes you too, right? That's all of us. All have sinned and we've fallen short of the glory of God. And yet the Bible says the glory, the good news, the message, the meaning of Christmas is that God entered into this broken world to make things right. To bring us home that we could be with him Forever, And that when we feel like we don't belong, God says we are loved. God, what makes us worthy is not what we do. It's not who we are. It's what God has done for us in Christ. In Christ. Have you ever felt unworthy? Have you ever felt unwanted? Have you ever felt insignificant, like maybe you're just not as important as somebody else, or sometimes you feel like you're just not as important as everybody else, yet Christmas forever changes the way we see ourselves. Because all that matters now is what you, what God says 
of me. With that in mind, look at Matthew chapter 1. We're going to read a couple verses, and then we're going to skip back to an Old Testament passage in the book of Genesis. We're going to find our text this morning in the life of a woman whose story could be told. When Gerald was singing this morning, it was like he was reading the journal, the diary of Tamar in the Old Testament. But look at what it says in Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Now this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now how many of you, let's be honest, how many of you when you read the Bible and you get to one of these genealogies and -and so-and-so begot so-and-so and and had many sons and they begot so-and-so, how many of you just skip that part when you're reading your one-year Bible plan? What's that noise? Is that me or somebody's phone? Is that an Amber Alert? Okay. So that's a great reminder. Hey, this is a great reminder. Turn your ringers off if you would. And, uh, and I don't mean to be, um, I'm not trying to make a gimmick out of this, but there's somebody missing right now at this moment. There's a mom and dad that are, their hearts are breaking. They're praying. They want that child to come home. It kind of sounds like the story of the Bible, doesn't it? Let's just pray for that family right now. Father, in Jesus' name, we don't know all the names, we don't know all the issues, but we know that someone is in trouble. Somebody's hurting right now. We just pray, Lord Jesus, that your grace, your mercy, your power, your protection would be over that child. We pray for that family, that they would know the God of all hope and the God of all comfort. We thank you, Lord, that you are the hound of heaven, and we just pray that you would help this child find their way home, that they could be safe and secure in the arms of people who love them and care for them. And Lord, we pray that for every person in this room in in a spiritual context in their relationship with God. So it's in Jesus' name that we do pray. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Matthew chapter 1. This is the genealogy. Now, notice this this, uh, uh, pattern of three, right? Look in verse 1. This is the genealogy of, say it with me, Jesus the Messiah, that's number one. The son of David, that's number two. The son of Abraham. Now, what he did there is he basically took the next few verses and he turned them upside down. In other words, he summarized the genealogy, and instead of starting with Abraham all the way to David, all the way to the Messiah, he says, Jesus, the Messiah. He didn't bury the lead. He starts with who he is, Jesus, the Messiah, and then he says, now, where'd this Messiah come from? Well, he was the son of David, but how did we get King David? Where did Israel come from? Well, he was the son of Abraham, the son of promise. Then beginning in verse 2, He goes through this long laundry list of names. Now Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac the father of Jacob. Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah the father of Perez and Zerah whose mother was, say it with me, Tamar. Now why Tamar is significant to a South Florida church, to a Fort Lauderdale congregation is this. Did you know that Tamar in Hebrew means palm tree? Her name means palm tree. Now, what's interesting about that is not just her name, kind of a curious name for a person. uh, Yet, what's interesting is, did you notice that it was all male names until we got to Tamar? Now, why that's even more significant is that how many of you know that in the book of Luke, there is another genealogy of Jesus, and at first glance, it it appears to be different than the genealogy in Matthew. I don't know if you've ever noticed that or not. They are different. Different scholars have talked about why that is. Matthew's writing to a Jewish audience. Luke is writing more for posterity. Luke was a physician. He was a historian. He not only wrote the Gospel of Luke, he wrote the book of Acts. He's writing more like a, like a, a documentary for biography channel about Jesus. He's, he's writing in, in more of a, a, for posterity in general, whereas Matthew really is writing for a, an inside crowd. He's writing to 
the people of God from the Old Testament, people who understood Jesus coming through the, the nation of Israel. And so there's a lot of different debate about what it means and why and how it is and whether they were whether the lists were entirely exhaustive or whether they were just representative, whether they skipped over some names and one included others and one didn't. Most scholars, I think, have kind of wound up saying that it has to do with leveret marriage and all these arcane Old Testament rules that actually we're going to learn about in the life of Tamar, where if Bonnie and I were married and I died and I have a brother, James, uh, my wife would become the wife of my brother, which would allow her to have a son, which would allow her to not live in poverty for the rest of her life. And so um, that, th there's all these arcane rules. So when it would say that Will was the son of Stephen, he could have been the son of Stephen or James because of leveret marriage and the way that all the real estate legalities work of who would get the property and, and so on. So, so some people think it's because of that. Some people think it's because they followed the line of Mary's family rather than Joseph's family. But whatever the case, the reality is we all know that all Scripture is inspired by God. And so when we notice these names that are listed here, we know there's meaning. We know there's a message. We know there's significance of why they were included. And when you think about Matthew's gospel, there are going to be five women who are listed in this naughty list. Five women that are listed among all these men, all these patriarchs, in this old, primitive, patriarchal society, five women's names make it into the genealogy of Jesus. So how many of you here think the Bible is this worn-out, old, chauvinistic book that ought to be left on the shelf and covered with dust because God hates women and the Apostle Paul hates women? Can I tell you something? If you're a feminist, you ought to thank God for the Bible. And, and what the Christian faith has done, not just for women's rights, not just for civil rights, how about human rights? Everywhere in the world, the gospel has gone, the standard for human rights has been raised. And so we don't have to apologize for what the Bible says about women. In fact, what the Bible says about women can lead you to faith in Jesus Christ if you read it and understand it. And, but what's fascinating is, even in Matthew's account, even in this patriarchal account, even in this passage, five women make it onto this list. And it is absolutely fascinating who they are and why they may have been included. Now, I just want you to skip down to verse 17. We're not going to read through the whole list this morning, but look at verse 17. Thus... Now remember, verse 1, he says, Jesus the Messiah, son of David, son of Abraham. Now verse 17, thus, there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, and 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. Now think about that. It's 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile, and 14 from the exile to Jesus, the Messiah. Doesn't that sound like a pretty strategic plan? Doesn't that sound like a sovereign God? I mean, I don't know about you, but I love symmetry. Tanya is here this morning, and Tanya helps, along with some other folks, decorate our facility and different things. And Tanya, what is the word I always tell you I love? When she says, what do you want it to look like? I always say what? Symmetry. In other words, if you got one thing on this side, if you got that, that big wreath over there on that side, I want another wreath over here that looks just like that. I love it when, don't you love it when things make sense? Don't, don't you love it when life just kind of works out and everything is explicable. I don't like it when things are inexplicable. I like it when things are where they're supposed to be. I like it when everything just kind of makes sense. 14 generations from Abraham to David. 
14 from David to the exile, 14 from the exile to the Messiah. Doesn't that just make a great Christmas card? Doesn't that just sound wonderful? And in the middle of this story of symmetry and and God's sovereignty, we find some names that don't fit in the symmetry. They don't make sense. They why is Tamar's name there? She's not the only mother involved in this list. There's a mother behind every one of these names. So why is she included? It says, now Judah, verse 3, the father of Perez and Zerah. Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Tamar. Tamar, like a palm tree. Could it be that God is telling us Tamar has a lesson about life that you and I need to understand? That if Jesus Christ came from Tamar, maybe she came for people like Tamar. And maybe like a, like a palm tree, you know, the Bible says the righteous flourish like a palm tree. Have you ever heard that verse? It's in the Psalms. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. Tree. What happens when, when hurricanes and storms come through and there's all these palm trees? Have you ever seen these tall, tall, tall palm trees with these thin, spindly, uh, uh, what do you call those things? Trunks, thank you. And, uh, and they have these real thin trunks and they go way up in the sky and they, they're usually kind of bent over. Have you ever wondered, how in the world do these trees survive these high winds? You see these strong pine trees and oak trees and other trees, they just get decimated by a storm. And yet some little spindly palm tree, why do they survive? They've learned to bend but not break. You know, that's pretty good advice for life, that we have to learn to bend with adversity. We've got to learn to bend with pain. We've got to learn sometimes... And, and we got to adapt and be flexible. we got to learn how to bend, but don't break. How many of you would like your finances to bend, but not break? How many of you would like your relationships to bend, but not break? How many of you know that one of the secrets of faith and trust and following Jesus Christ, friends, is you got to learn that your faith is going to have to bend sometimes, but not break? break. I'm going to tell you something. Tamar was close to breaking. In fact, she did. Tamar just went all Maury Povich on the situation. I mean, Tamar was on Inside Edition, hard copy, sent a producer down just to talk to her. I mean, Tamar would have been on the cover of the National Enquirer if they were publishing it back then in her day. Tamar, it was a mixed up messed up person. So how did she find her way into this incredible list of how God's plan of redemption brought Jesus into this world? And more important, how can you find your name on the most important list of all? Take your Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 38. Genesis chapter 38, we're going to look each week over the next couple weeks at some of these names. We're not going to have time to get to all of them, but we're going to look at just a few of these incredible stories of God's grace and God's mercy and God's redemption. Look at Genesis chapter 38. And uh, once you have your place there, let me tell you about a lady named Liz. Now, Liz was a young woman who grew up She was raised in a good home. Her parents kind of tried to raise her to be a good girl and to to do things right. Um, The only problem was when she hit hit 16, she started hanging around kind of the wrong crowd. Anybody relate to that? Started hanging around a fast crowd, faster than she was used to. In fact, she said she smoked her first joint on the steps of the Statue of Liberty. How ironic. How ironic that her life of addiction and dependence and, and, uh, and, and, and abusing her body and abusing herself, kind of being trapped and stuck in, in that lifestyle that she was in, it all started as a teenager on the steps of the Statue of Liberty on a school trip. 
That's where she smoked marijuana for the first time. She said she began a passionate relationship with drugs. To the point that when she was 26 years old, she was a disc jockey. Her life literally, I mean, it's no cliche, her life was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Four or five nights a week, she found herself on a bar stool someplace looking for companionship and comfort. She said, I found a lot of companionship, but I never found any comfort. She was a disc jockey who moved from town to town. Finally, she wound up the afternoon disc jockey on the biggest rock station in Detroit. They called her the, 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 uh, the D- Detroit Lady of Rock. At 26 years of age, she was making money. She was living a fast life. And one day, Liz found herself at her desk doing a line of cocaine in the middle of the day in her office. Now, are you ready for this? (laughs) Right about the time she was doing that line of cocaine, Howard Stern who was the morning disc jockey at the same station, walked past her desk and said, Liz, you know, you've got to clean up your act. You're in trouble. He walked away, and Liz Curtis Higgs said to herself, you know, when Howard Stern tells you you're a mess... I must really be a mess. She said he was right. I did need to clean up my act, but I didn't know how. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to go. For a few more years, she continued to struggle till finally she came to know Christ. And Liz Curtis Higgs today is a Bible teacher and a speaker. She has taught the gospel and shared with women's groups and churches in all 50 states dozens of countries. Her books have sold four or five million copies. You know, I know what the book she is most famous for. Liz Curtis Higgs wrote a book called Bad Girls of the Bible. And on the cover of that book, when it was originally published, it was a picture of Liz Curtis Higgs. And she had a, um, well, I'm going to need a lot of help today. What do you call those things you put in front of your eyes in Arab countries? A veil. Thank you. <clears throat> Tree trunk veil. All right, we're working on our words today. She, she had her face covered by a veil. I wonder if she was thinking of Tamar when she put that veil over her face. The veil. An attempt to hide. A covering, literally a covering. Isn't that what a lot of people are looking for today? Some way to cover over all of our... Don't you wish there was spiritual whiteout and you could just cover over all the bad choices that you've made? Look at what it says in Genesis chapter 38 and verse 1. Genesis 38 verse 1. Now at that time Judah left his brothers and went down to stay with a man of Adullam named Hira. Now what's interesting about Judah is if you read Genesis chapter 37... Genesis 37 is where Joseph's wonderful brothers, you want to talk about sibling rivalry, Joseph's brothers are mad, they're jealous that his father loves him more than everybody else, gives him the coat of many colors. They throw Joseph down in a pit and they're going to kill him. Judah stands up and says, hey, let's not kill him. Now you're starting to think Judah sounds like a pretty good guy, right? He's the only one that's going to keep Joseph alive. But what was Judah's reasoning behind not killing Joseph. Hey, why don't we just sell him? Let's sell him into slavery. Some Egyptian trader will come by, we can sell him. And after all, he's our own flesh and blood. I mean, we don't want to kill our own brother. In other words, what Judah is saying is this, let somebody else kill him. But I don't want, in other words, I don't want to see myself as a murderer. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to betray him, and I'm going to leave him for dead. Perhaps a life that would be worse than death as a slave. 
But he says, you know, I don't want to get my hands dirty. I don't want to look in the mirror every day and say, oh, I killed my own brother. So I'll just, I'll just let life take care of him. Now, now, what happened to Judah after that? That's in Genesis 37. Genesis 38, Judah leaves his brothers and he goes down to stay with a man. In other words, what Judah does is he leaves his family, he leaves God's people, and he goes and he marries in to the very people that God told him not to marry into. In other words, he basically leaves his faith, right? Now, if you read verses 2 all the way down to verse 12, um, you find out kind of where our story gets, you know, where, where it happens. I'm not going to read all of these verses because I'm not going to read them all with my mother in this room and my children in this room. Because there are some parts of the Bible that are PG. There are some parts that are PG-13. I think Song of Solomon and Genesis 38 might be X. So I'm not going to read it all. But something tells me all the young men in this room will read their Bible this afternoon. <clears throat> Verse 2. Judah met the daughter of a Canaanite man named Shua. He married her. He made love to her. She became pregnant, gave birth to a son. And then she had, they had another son. Then they had another son. So here's Judah. And Judah is the lead character in this little thing called My Three Sons. He has three sons. And Judah finds a wife for his firstborn whose name happens to be Er. Like Error? But his name is Er. And, uh, and Er, the Bible says, this is a bad man. This is not a good man. Now, we're all sinners. Everybody's a sinner. Apparently, Er was in a whole different category all of his own. And this was just a very uh, wicked, wicked person. So wicked, in fact, that God just kills him. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And you know what? Sometimes people make choices that are so terrible, it actually ends their life. Um, and so Er dies. So what happens to Tamar? Tamar is the wife of Er. She uh, Judah goes to his second son. He says, listen, I want you to take care of Tamar. She's got to have some children for her, her first husband's name. Otherwise, she's going to be a widow in that time, in that culture. At her age, being a widow, she's going to wind up probably as either a prostitute or just impoverished or, or whatever. And so he says, I want you to, to marry Tamar and give her some children, which is in essence a lifeline for her economically and socially. And so... This, this second son, he takes her as his wife, and I don't want to be too graphic here, but the bottom line is he uses her. He abuses her. He bruises her. He takes what he wants from her, but he doesn't give her a child. Can you imagine the diabolical situation that we're talking about here? And then finally, the Bible says he's so wicked, God kills him too. Now she's married two men, they've both died, and what happens? Everybody blames her. Every man she marries ends up dead. No one stops to think about these men and the choices they made. But now she's blamed. Let me tell you who especially blames her. Judah blames her. So Judah says, I have a third son. But uh, he's too young to marry, which was true. He says, why don't you go back to your father's people and live as a widow among your people? And when my third boy gets old enough, as is the custom in leveret marriage, he, you know, he's obligated to marry this widow, and so you're going to be taken care of. In other words, just wait a while. You know, everything's going to be okay. You know, just be patient, and it's all going to be okay. Now, skip down. Uh, to verse 11. Judah then says to his daughter-in-law Tamar, live as a widow in your father's house till my son Shelah grows up. For he thought, well, he may die too, just like his brothers. So Tamar went to live in her father's household. You got to understand what that means. She lived as a widow at her age in this culture. It was, she was an outcast. She had no money. She had no property. She had no rights. She was at the mercy of, of the men that were around. And then listen to what it says in verse 12. This is a very important phrase. Are you ready? After a long time, 
How long, how long is Tamar living as a widow? A long time. The daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, dies. Judah had recovered from his grief. He went up to Timnah to the men who were shearing his sheep. Now, this is a tragic irony or maybe a hilarious irony. Judah goes up to shear his sheep, to check on his sheep being sheared. And let me tell you, Judah's about to get fleeced. And so, listen to what happens. When Tamar was told, verse 13, hey, your father-in-law is on his way to Timnah to shear his sheep. Look at verse 14. She took off her widow's clothes, covered herself with what? A veil to disguise herself. That's very important. Very important. Understand. What did she want to do? Listen up. What has she wanted for all these years? She's wanted to be somebody else. She didn't want to be the outcast. She wanted to be the wife. She wanted to be the mother. She wanted a life. She wanted to have significance. She wanted to belong. She wanted to be loved. She didn't want to be cast aside. And so what does she do? She changes the way she sees herself, and she changes the way other people will see her. Only... This isn't exactly a great Sunday school class that she's been attending lately. And what does she decide to do? She covers herself with a veil to disguise herself, then sat down at the entrance to a name, which is on the road to Timnah, for she saw that though Shelah had now now grown up, she had not been given to him as his wife. When Judah saw her, he saw a woman by the side of the road wearing a veil, dressed as a prostitute. Maybe she knew a little something about Judah from her years gone by, that she figured this is what's going to work with this guy. He'll fall for this. It says, um, when Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute for she covered her face. Not realizing she was his own daughter-in-law, he went over to her by the roadside and he said, come now, let me sleep with you. And what will you give me to sleep with you? She asked. I'll send you a young goat from my flock. You have to understand, it may sound silly to us, but that was a significant gift. This was going to change, this was going to make a difference for her. If you're a prostitute, In Palestine, in these days, and somebody gives you a young goat, that's no small thing. He says, I'm going to send you a young goat. Will you give me something as a pledge until you send it? In other words, what is she saying? I don't trust you. And why should I? (laughs) He says, what pledge should I give you? Your seal and its cord. And the staff in your hand, she answered. So he gave them to her, and he slept with her, and she became pregnant. Her plan is working. After she left, she took off her veil, put on her widow's clothes again. Meanwhile, Judah sent the young goat by his friend, the Adolamite, in order to get his pledge back from the woman, but he couldn't find her. He asked him in. Can you imagine this guy, Judah's friend? He's walking around with this young goat looking for a prostitute. And he says he couldn't find her. Look at verse 21. He asked the men who lived there, where is that shrine prostitute who was beside the road? There hasn't been any shrine prostitute here. They don't know what he's talking about. So he went back to Judah and he said, I couldn't find her. Besides, the men who lived there said there hasn't been any shrine prostitute here. Then Judah said, let her keep what she has. Why? Because it's the right thing to do because he owes her. Why does he want her to keep his stuff? Because he doesn't want to be embarrassed. He doesn't want to be found out. He can't go down there and sit there with a sign... Um, I, I hired a prostitute and I haven't been able to pay her. 
He says, we're going to be a laughing stock. I'm going to be a laughing stock. What saved Joseph's life in Genesis 37? Judah's desire to see himself as better than he was. What's going to save Tamar's life in Genesis 38? Judah cares what people think about him. Judah needs the approval of other people, right? Does that sound like anybody you know? And then look at what it says in verse 24. Now, about three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law Tamar is guilty of prostitution. As a result, she is now pregnant. Now, this three months later, Judah hears this story. You remember, you remember your daughter-in-law Tamar that you sent away? You know what? She has become a prostitute, and she is pregnant. And what does Judah say about her? Bring her out, and let's burn her to death. We're going to have our own version of the Salem witch trials right here. We're going to put this woman on a spit, and we're going to burn her. That's what she deserves because she has so dishonored the family name, which is really what he cares about in the end. He cares about what it's going to say about him. As she was being brought out, she sent a message to her father-in-law. She says, oh, by the way, Tamar, how would you like to get this text message? I'm pregnant, all right. And let me tell you who the baby daddy is. It's the man who owns these. And she gives him back his pledge his staff, his seal, his cord, something that's a signature. I mean, something he can't deny. In other words, everybody's going to know it's his. She's not making it up. I mean, this is the blue dress right here. This is the blue dress. See if you, listen to this phrase. It says, see if you recognize who this belongs to. Judah recognized them. He recognized a whole lot more than that. Because here's what he says next. She is more righteous than I, since I wouldn't give her to my son. In other words, for the once in his life, he recognized, you know what? I'm the bad guy here. What? In other words, he, he, let, let me be very clear what I'm about to say here. This passage is not condoning what Tamar did. God is not saying here the ends justify the means. If somebody wrongs you, you can wrong them. That's not the message of this story. By the way, have you ever asked yourself, why do good people do bad things? You ever asked yourself that question? Have you ever asked yourself, what was I thinking when I said that? Or did that or thought that. Incidentally, you know, some people in the church <clears throat> find it easy to throw stones at people who get involved in scandalous sin. And can I just tell you, <clears throat> the Bible says there are sins of commission and there are sins of omission. Sometimes we sin by doing things we know are wrong. Other times we sin, we commit sin by not doing things we know are right. And did you know there's a great verse in the Psalms where David says, God, forgive my hidden sins. My hidden sins. Hidden from who? I don't think he's talking about hidden from other people. Most of our sins are hidden from other people. When he says forgive my hidden sins, I think he's talking about all the ways I sin, and I don't even know what I did or how I did it. You know, there's a lot of us that probably would have gotten in a lot more trouble if we'd have been in the wrong place at the wrong time. Can I tell all of you young people here today, if Liz Curtis Higgs hadn't have been hanging around the fringe she was hanging around on that step of the Statue of Liberty, it could have changed the trajectory of her entire life. Have you ever heard the phrase, there but for the grace of God, go I. There but for the grace of God, 
go I. Listen, when you hear about some celebrity Christian that gets into trouble, don't look at them like you don't know how it could happen. I'm not saying this to minimize or trivialize sin, but what I'm saying is this. Why do smart people do dumb things? Why do godly people sometimes do ungodly? Why do good people do bad things? I think for the same reasons that Judah did a lot of the things he did. And I think because of the reason Tamar did what she did. Why did Tamar do what she did? Tamar had lived with blame and punishment. And she thought, Since everybody blames me, I must be worthy of punishment. Robert McGee, the great Christian writer who wrote The Search for Significance, he writes about different ways people struggle and cope with with sin and brokenness and what it means. One of the things he says is that a lot of people play the blame game. Have you ever played the blame game? The blame game says this, those who fail are unloved and worthy of punishment. So what happens is, if you treat people with contempt, if, you treat, if you're hypercritical, if you're always finding fault, what happens is, as a parent, if you're constantly telling a child that you're, you failed, you're unloved, you're worthy of punishment, what happens is, that little boy, that little girl, they grow up and they say, I deserve to be punished. That's just who I am. They blame themselves. They're driven to avoid failure at all costs. They don't want to fail. They don't want to make a mistake. They can't fail. Because what it would do is reinforce their worst vision of who they really are. Can I tell you what happens to people who play the blame game too long? It isn't enough anymore to just punish themselves. Now they've got to punish other people because they think now everybody deserves to be punished. Have you ever met one of these people? You ever dealt with somebody like that? Those who fail are unloved, unworthy. They deserve to be punished. Why did Tamar do this horrific, horrific thing? Because she had sat there and blamed herself for all these years. And now, she wanted Judah to feel just like she had felt. She wanted other people to be punished too. Can I tell you, there isn't anything more human than that. There's not anything more human than than a person who feels punished and unworthy wanting listen misery loves company and that's what she did listen to the rest of the story Judah recognized his stuff he said she is more righteous than I notice he doesn't say hey she's righteous he doesn't say what she did is good he said you know what What I did is worse than what she did. In other words, what he's saying is, you know, I used, abused, and bruised this woman, and now look what I've turned her into. And he did not sleep with her again. That's a great verse. I love that phrase. And Judah did not sleep with her again. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. She didn't have one baby, she had two. You think maybe that's just God's way of saying to Tamar, hey, you're special. You're not what everybody else thinks about you. As she was giving birth, one of them put out his hand. So the midwife took a scarlet thread and tied it on his wrist and said, this one came out first. 
The midwife thinks they're just, you know, creating a nice memory and, uh, you know, helping the family to make a good story of which one was born first. But when that midwife tied that scarlet thread, incidentally, next week, we're going to talk about Rahab, who's also mentioned on this naughty list. What does Rahab throw out her window to save those spies? A scarlet cord. You think that's an accident? What's this, what's this passage talking about? It's talking about the grace of God. The grace of God. It says, the midwife took a scarlet thread, tied it on his wrist and said, this one came out first. But when he drew back his hand, his brother came out. And he said, so, so this is how you have, quote, broken out. And they named him Perez. The name Perez means literally to break, to break out. So what do we have? How does the story of Tamar end? Until she's mentioned in this great list in the genealogy of Christ. She has these twin boys. And what's the theme of her story? Grace and brokenness. Grace and brokenness. What, what, what is the scripture saying? Listen. God uses your bruises. God uses your bruises. You can find purpose in your pain. Now I want to tell you three things. And Pat Panera, wave your hand over there, Pat. Pat, I know a a feeling of dread came upon you when you realized everything I said up till now is just the introduction. (laughs) I'm going to give you my three points And all I'm going to do is just give them to you. And you're going to have to let it sink in because we're out of time. Are you ready? Here's three things that pain can do. Pain can be a breaking point. Isn't that what happened to Tamar? A long time passed. She's hurting. She's abandoned. She's alone. She's been used, abused, bruised. And she finally just snaps. I wonder if there's anybody here today and you're at a breaking point. You ever been there? Pain can not only be a breaking point. Number two, write this down. Pain can be a turning point. Look at the choices that were made. She made her choice. And then when confronted with his sin, Judah finally makes the right choice. And he, the Bible says he didn't sleep with her again. He recognized his responsibility. You know, what I did was worse than what she did. Doesn't that kind of sound like what Jesus told all those Pharisees when they had the woman caught in adultery? He said, let the one without sin, you pick up the first stone. He didn't say what she did wasn't deserving of punishment. He just said they were in no position to judge her. Powerful. Pain can be a breaking point. Listen, friends, if you're here today and you're hurting, pain can be a turning point in your life. And number three, write this down. A breaking point can lead to a turning point, and a turning point can lead to a grace point. There's a scarlet thread that runs all through the Bible. It's the grace of God. You know what the solution is for blame? Feeling that I'm unloved and worthy of punishment? Here's the solution. It's a a big theological word called propitiation. Propitiation. And what it means is, it means that when Jesus died on the cross... Or when the blood of a lamb was shed in the Old Testament and the high priest would walk into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement and he would sprinkle that blood over the mercy seat. What was the mercy seat? It was the lid on the Ark of the Covenant. What was it? It was a covering over the presence of God. It would cover your sin. That's what atonement does. 
When, when the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us, cleanse us of all unrighteousness. How many of you have been Christians for a long time? You've heard 1 John 1, 9 a thousand times. If we confess, he is faithful and just. He will forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Can I tell you the part of that verse that people don't think about? Sometimes things are only obvious once they're pointed out. Everybody focuses on the confession in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess. So what's the secret to forgiveness? You've got to confess. Have you confessed? If you confess, God will forgive. Isn't that what that verse is all about? It's a, it's a call to, to confess. Can I tell you what the most important part of that verse is? It isn't what you do. It's, it's what God has done. If we confess, he is what? Faithful and what? That doesn't make any sense, does it? Shouldn't that verse say, if we confess, he is faithful and compassionate, and he will forgive you? Doesn't that sound right? Isn't there more symmetry to that? Wouldn't a poet write it that way? Wouldn't Shakespeare have said, if you will confess your sin, God will be faithful and merciful. But what does it say? God forgives because he loves, because he's compassionate, because he's merciful. Let me tell you why God will forgive your sin if you confess. God will forgive you because of his justice. Have you ever thought about what that means? God forgives you, not only out of love, but out of his justice. Why? Because Jesus Christ made propitiation for your sin. Like the blood of a lamb being sprinkled on the mercy seat. Romans 3.25 says that's what Jesus' death on the cross is. It's the mercy seat. That Jesus died to take away your sin. He took the penalty. He took your punishment. That's why you don't have to play the blame game because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. The wages of sin is death. Friends, that's why Jesus died. So when you think God's grace isn't sufficient to forgive you and you need to wallow in guilt and shame and wander through life feeling unworthy of God's goodness... What are you really saying? You're saying to Jesus, your death on the cross just wasn't enough to cover my sin. Let me tell you what my pastor used to say, and I've always remembered this. You might want to write this down. Whatever you uncover, God will cover. And whatever you cover, God will uncover. So if you're here today, and like Judah and Tamar and Stephen and everybody else in this room and everybody else on this planet, if you know, as Paul said, Jesus came to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Have you ever felt that way? Just thank God that his death on the cross took all that punishment. And Jesus Christ, his coming into this world. What does Tamar's name in the Christmas story say? It is a message to everybody in this room. The only thing that matters now is what he says about you. And here's what he says. He says you're strong even when you feel weak. He says you are loved right? He says, you belong. He he says, you are held. God says he loves you. Here's what you remember. When you're at the breaking point, remember God hears you. God knows where you are. He sees you. When you're at the turning point, remember God is calling you to faith. He's calling you to put your faith and trust in him. And when you're at the grace point, remember that God loves you. He's full of grace 
and truth. And in the midst of brokenness, God reaches in and he loves us. Now listen, Liz Curtis Higgs was told by Howard Stern, you better clean up your act. And she said he was right. But you know what? That was a turning point. That was a breaking point. It didn't become a grace point. Because what did she hear? It was true, but it wasn't what she needed. What she heard was, you're a mess. What she heard was, you're dirty. What she heard was, you're broken. What she didn't hear was, hey, there's hope. I believe in you. I love you. And here's what happened. Liz finally met this wonderful Christian couple that worked at the radio station, both husband and wife. This young couple worked at the same station with her a few years later. They had a little baby. They were like this little Norman Rockwell family picture. But for some reason, they just loved her. They reached out to her. Listen to this. They were so kind to her. They invited her to their home. They they just loved her. They never, ever judged her. They never criticized her. They never told her what a mess she was, even though certainly they knew, they could see. They weren't blind. Listen to this. She said, they never even invited me to their church. She said, so I invited myself. She said, I'd never met anybody like them. I wanted to know what it was all about. She came the first Sunday, and she said, the first Sunday I was at that church, I knew this was the answer. This was what I needed. But it took her six more weeks before she really came to the point where she put her life in God's hands. On the seventh time she came to church, she got saved. Now, let me tell you something. She didn't need a moral policeman. She needed a spiritual paramedic. And can I tell you something? If you're here today and you don't know you're a sinner, I would be guilty of malpractice if I didn't tell you. All have sinned and the wages of sin is death. If you're listening to me online right now, I'm going to tell you something. You can't earn your way to heaven. You can't be good enough to get to heaven. You can't be smart enough or clever enough. You can't do it on your own. All have sinned, all have fallen short. But can I tell you something? If you're here today and you already know you're a sinner, in fact, that's all you think about all the time is how guilty you feel and how lost you are. Today, I just want to be a paramedic to say, hey, there's hope. God loves you. Jesus died for you. You can have a brand new life. And you know what? All Liz Curtis Higgs needed was somebody to just love her right where she was. And if that's you today, I'm going to tell you something. That's the message of Christmas. Jesus came for Tamar and people like her. He was born for her. He lived for her. He died for her. He rose for her. Can I tell you? Jesus came for you. He lived for you. He died for you. He rose for you. And one day, he's coming again for you. Let's bow our heads and pray. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed all over this room. If you're here this morning and you have never received Christ as your Savior, you will know it. You will know it (laughs) like he was knocking on the door of your heart. Would you just say a simple prayer today? Say, Pastor Stephen, I know who you're talking to. It's me. I've been looking for something all my life. Today you realize it's not something you need. It's someone. And today you want to put your life in God's hands. You want to confess your sin. You want to receive Christ as your Savior. And you want to say, Jesus, the best I know how, I just put my life in your hands and I trust you. Just make that your prayer right now. Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Change me. Make me a brand new person. The best I know how, I want to go your way. Others of you are here, you're already a believer, but maybe you're struggling with guilt or blame. 
condemnation. And today, you need to taste the forgiveness of God in a fresh way. Today, would you just say, Lord Jesus, thank you that you made me worthy when you bought me at such a such an expensive price thank you Jesus that I am forgiven thank you that I'm clean I'm whiter than snow if anyone's in Christ they're a new creation old things pass away all things become new today would you taste the forgiveness of God if you confess your sin he's faithful he's just friend Jesus already died for your sin And whom the sun sets free, they are free indeed. Just make that your prayer today, Lord. Lord, thank you that I'm free. Thank you that I'm free from guilt, free from sin, free from judgment. You forgave the guilt of my sin. Those of you that are watching online, if you prayed that prayer with me or if you have a decision you want to make for Christ, Would you send us an email? Just send an email to info at gracepoint.net. Info at gracepoint.net. Just send me an email this week. Pastor Stephen, I prayed or I need to talk to somebody. Can you pray with me? Connect with us. Let us know the decision you want to make for Christ. We want to encourage you in your relationship with God. Father, seal these words now in our hearts. Bless this time of worship as we lift our hearts and voices to you. In Christ's name, amen. Joy to the world. Sing it with us. Joy to the world. The Lord is come. Come on, lift your voice. Let her receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing.
Because I know you'll make a way. I don't always understand, and I don't always get to see, but I will believe it. Yes, I will believe it. Cause you make mountains move, you make giants fall, you use songs of praise to shake prison walls, and I will speak to my fear. I will preach to my doubt that you were faithful then. You'll be faithful now. And I am standing on your word. Amen, amen. God bless you and be seated. Hey, we want to thank everybody for joining us today for worship. Those of you that are online, God bless you for being with us, being a part of this service. I don't know about you, but this week I'm going to go back and listen to some of that music again. And I want you to be reminded the only thing that matters now is what he says about you. Amen. If you want to give and support the ministry of Grace Point Church, we have offering boxes in the back of this room. We also, uh, the easiest way to give is online. Those of you that are joining us online right now, just go to gracepoint.net, click on the word giving, and uh, you can help us change the world one life at a time for the glory of God. This Wednesday night at 7 p.m., we're going to have a special workshop. It's going to kind of be like Santa's workshop this month on December, only it's going to be the Grace Point workshop. We're going to do some workshops in the next couple of weeks on Wednesday night that will be encouraging and empowering for you. Pat Panera and I are going to be leading a workshop this Wednesday at 7. It will be online, so just go to uh, our YouTube channel or you can go to gracepoint.net, click on the word watch right at the very top of the web page, and join us 7 p.m. for a SHAPE workshop. SHAPE, S-H-A-P-E, spiritual gifts, heart or passion, abilities, personality, experience, life experience. God has shaped every one of us for service. 
And we're going to discover our shape, find your spiritual gift, your, your passion, your abilities, your personality, temperament, your life experience, and how God can use you to make a difference. So if that sounds like fun, and if you want to join us, we're going to be online Wednesday night, 7 p.m., for our Shape Workshop. Hope you'll be there and be a part of it. Next Sunday morning, 10 a.m., we're going to continue on the naughty list. We're going to tell another incredible, amazing story of God's grace in the Old Testament. Hope you'll be here, be a part of it, either online or on campus. Tell a friend, tell a neighbor, tell somebody you know who needs to know Christ. Invite them to be with you. This is the best time of the year, one of the best times of the year to invite your friends. Most people will connect with the church if somebody they know and trust would just invite them. So don't be like Liz and wait to invite yourself. Wait for your friend to invite themselves. Go ahead and invite your friends and neighbors and family to, uh, to come and, and uh, join us for Christmas here at Grace Point. Okay? Listen, God bless you for being here today. Everybody have a great week. We'll see you Wednesday night online, next Sunday at 10 a.m. God bless you. You're dismissed. Great job.